uh, there was God, there was this guy, he was uh, one of my viewers and he did a meta study. I think it's on, on Reddit where he basically took just dozens and dozens of program reviews over like five or six popular programs, mm -hmm. crunched all the data and made this like meta analysis. Now I was impressed with the amount of work that went into it. And it's kind of neat to go over, but you have to look at something like that and you're like, okay, well, you got to take it not just with a grain of salt. You got to take it with the whole salt mine because of all of, all of the sources of error, all of the variables that you can't even begin to consider the selection bias and everything else. Um, what, what do you see as some of the, some of the rocks in the shoe of like researchers today in that field? Are, are there like, like a few key big problems that they're up against? Uh, like what, what's your, what's your take on the state of, uh, of that side of things? Oh man. Uh, <laughs> how, how, how long do you want to dwell on this question? Cause I, th th this is, this is one of the areas that I, that I do put a lot of thought into. Um, but yeah, so a, a few big things I'll tell you, number one, far and away, the biggest issue is just funding. Um, like I, I get consistently frustrated by some of the criticisms of exercise science I see online. Um, where even when the criticisms are valid, they're kind of uh, the the tone that comes with them is like, oh, like these these stupid idiots doing these studies, they they don't know what they're doing. Like they need bigger sample sizes, they need to run the studies for longer. Like, like why don't they know they should do this stuff? And like almost all the time they do. And it's just a matter of like, hey, all of the things you're suggesting that would improve these studies, they all cost money. And, you know, this project was probably done on like a thousand dollar grant, two thousand dollar grant. You know, we're, we're not getting 50 million dollar R1 biomedical grants uh, from the NIH for, you know, hypertrophy research like that. That's just not how it works. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think that is the the, the biggest hurdle. Um there, there's just not enough funding uh, spread around enough to do enough of the studies that I think need to get done. Um, and that's, you know, that that's not a criticism of the researchers. A criticism that I do have of not not all, but a lot of the researchers researchers in our field um, is relatively poor statistical literacy, which is, you know, I, I don't mean that as like too, too harsh of a criticism because like, you know, it, it, I, I think people underestimate how much academics need to be on top of and be good at, um, you know, cause there's a large amount of just like, uh, uh like executive know-how, like, like running a lab is like running a business. Um, you also have to know a lot about just like physiology, research design, you might have 30 pieces of equipment in your lab that you have to know how to use, have to do upkeep on, um, like you're, you're monitoring, uh, like everyone, like all of your grad students work and like helping them, mentoring them. You have a teaching load as well. Um, and you know, then another very important thing that you should know a lot about is statistics. Um, cause Ultimately, once you collect the data, you got to analyze it. How do you do that? You do it with statistics. Um, and I do think that for people who want to go into STEM fields, uh, the the mathier folks, like the the inherently mathier folks, tend to just kind of like gravitate to other STEM fields uh, <laughs> instead of exercise science. Um, and so, yeah, there there are, I would say a, a pretty solid chunk of papers that I read have like pretty obvious statistical issues. Oftentimes they're not like fatal flaws. Like, like someone will choose an appropriate test, run it correctly. And then, and then just like misinterpret the output. So like a, a common example is uh, how you interpret ANOVAs. Like if you have a, a parallel groups design taking measures at pre and post, um, if you run an ANOVA, which stands for analysis of variance, it'll give you a main effect for group, main effect for time, uh, and a group by time interaction. And oftentimes, like in, in you know, I 
so most of the time, if you're running a parallel groups design, what you're interested in is whether the treatment effect of whatever you were studying was different between the groups. So you're interested in whether the change from, you know, pre to post in group A was different than the change pre to post in group B. And so for, for that, you're looking for the interaction effect, the group by time interaction. Um, but oftentimes, like researchers will see a main effect for group or an effect for time in one group, but not the other, like reporting this group experienced a significant change, this group didn't experience a significant change. Therefore, the changes between the two groups differed, um, which, is, which is not how you should interpret those tests. But I don't know, like that that's like a, a fairly basic thing that as a reader, like if if you understand statistics pretty well, you're just like, oh, well, like they botched it, but like they still reported their data correctly. So now like I personally can still interpret what they found. But for a reader without much of a statistical background, they might uh, uh, find themselves gravitating to erroneous conclusions that the authors drew and just kind of taking them at face value. So like that, that's a potential issue. I mean, even among the people in our field who are more interested in statistics, like a lot of those folks will do meta analyses at some point. Uh, and a recent paper that was that was like just published like last like either earlier this week or last week um, reported that like somewhere around 85 percent of the meta analyses in our field have at least one statistical error. <laughs> um, so, you know, like that's that's a pretty common problem. Um, I, I'd say that those are that those are the two biggest issues. Another major one, though, is that so within academia, your teaching load versus research load is often dictated, um, again, by like funding and kind of the prestige of the department. And so if you are like a, a full professor in biology in like a, at an R1 school, you might not actually teach at all, or you only teach like one class, like a, a graduate level class, you know, to make sure your grad students are up to speed for the for the research you're doing, basically. Um, that is not the position most exercise science departments are in. And so, um, like, oftentimes, like the professors will have really, really heavy teaching loads. Um, and not a ton of time to apply for grants and, and do their own research. And so like a, a lot of the research that gets published, um, like I, I wish I had numbers on this. I bet, I bet that comfortably over half of the research that gets published in our field were either like master's theses or doctoral dissertations um, and, and weren't like projects originating with, with the PIs themselves. And so, like, I, I don't know, uh, oftentimes, like, especially master's projects, like, you shouldn't expect them to be that good. Like, it's it's the first study that someone has ever done. And I think sometimes people will look at studies that maybe have, like, eh, kind of iffy designs, like, seem kind of weak and be like, ah, damn, the researchers in this field don't know what they're doing. But it's like, no, the, the senior author on that paper that probably wouldn't have been the study they ran if they had a $10,000 grant and could draw it up the way they wanted. But no, like th this is a project that a uh, uh, 24 year old kid uh, trying to do the whole thing in a single semester on a shoestring budget could throw together. Um, so, you know, if, if there was more money, the PIs didn't have to do quite as much teaching could spend more time in the lab. Like I, I think that would improve the overall quality of research as well. But yeah, I mean, like there, there are a lot of like other little like specific things that one could point out. I mean, an, another big one is just equipment that also comes back to money. Like good lab equipment's fucking expensive. It's extremely expensive. Um, like a, a really good ultrasound probe, like if you're doing hypertrophy research and you want to be able to directly assess hypertrophy instead of just getting like rough metrics like lean mass or even like you'll still occasionally see studies published measuring limb circumferences. 
um you know like sometimes like i i see criticisms online being like oh these these researchers don't know what the fuck they're doing like why are they still taking limb circumference measurements when mri exists it's like well almost no one in our field uses MRI because that's like even more expensive. Um, you're not going to have an, in, in uh, you're not going to have an MRI machine in your lab. Like you're going to have to pay to like rent that machine out from the medical school probably. Um, and even like ultrasound, like a, a good, a good ultrasound machine, like a really high quality B mode ultrasound machine is going to run you like a hundred grand. Um, and so if the grants you're working with, cause like lab funding mostly comes out of the grants you get, unless you just have a school that gives you a ton of startup money. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if the grants you're getting are a thousand dollars here, $5,000 there, maybe $10,000 there. If, if you get really lucky, um, it's going to be hard to scrape together the funding for an ultrasound machine. So, you know, like folks will be like, why didn't they take better measures? And it's like, well, they didn't have the money to take better measures to like to purchase the necessary equipment. So yeah, I mean, I, I do think, I do think a lot of the issues just come down to money. <laughs> yeah. And, and admittedly I've in the past, I mean, I've been guilty of, of picking apart studies or at least some of the figures who um, that's kind of the thing that, that, props them up that they're leaning on maybe more so than practical experience. And that's when I start to get a little bit skeptical, but that it leads to what you're, what you're talking about, like inherent limitations with the studies. Cause I, I think of what you're talking about, which is a limitation of these people having access to things that will help mm -hmm. with the study. But then I feel like there's also a limitation even beyond that. Like hypothetically, if you had a billion dollars to whatever you could to study, whatever you wanted in the field, in five years of applying that money, it's, I, I try to think of, of like what paradigm shifting information would we, would we come across? Is it likely that we would be able to increase everybody's performance by a, a, a predictable margin? Or does it still come down to like, just the talent of the person you're talking about, how consistent they are, how motivated they are, and, you know, kind of the big rocks that we generally talk about. I don't, I don't foresee a world where better research can double the results that everyone sees. Like I, I, I might be too pessimistic about that, but I, I, I just, I just don't see that happening. Um, but I do think, I do think that there are probably still some big rocks to turn over and some avenues that have been underexplored that could improve results for a lot of people. Um, are, are there specific uh, things that that you have in mind or that, that you've had experience um, with? There, there are specific methods, like research methodologies okay. I have in mind. So yeah. one, of the, uh, one of the key weaknesses with most of the research in our field is they is it's studies running parallel groups designs. So, you know, you recruit 30 people, randomize 15 to, you know, undergo one type of training, randomize 15 to undergo another type of training. You know, you run the study, you put them on different programs. And at the end, you just see like, hey, did group A gain more strength than group B? Did they gain more muscle than group B? Whatever. Um, and, the you know, the issue with that is it... Um, like completely washes out inter-individual differences. So, you know, I, I'm sure you've noticed as a coach, like you might, uh, you know, j just kind of like philosophically through your practice, you've kind of honed in on a general style of training that tends to work pretty well for, for most of the clients who train most of the time. But then you have clients where that style of training doesn't really seem to work quite as well. You troubleshoot, you do some experimenting, and you find a style of training that does work really well for that individual client um, when when kind of like your 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 base approach to training didn't work quite as well. Um, and, you know, that that applies across the board. Like there there are um, th there are inter individual differences, not just in terms of how well you respond to training in general, but also like what type of training you respond best to. But you don't get that in a parallel groups design like. You know, you could run a study that says like, hey, on average, 
you know, training program A is better than training program B. Like we, we ran the stats, significant group by time interaction, P less than 0.05, cool. And then, you know, the, the interpretation of that is, Hey, most of you guys should be doing this, like, like program A, like whatever, whatever intervention that was seems to work better than intervention B. But on an individual level, it could be that, uh, program A works better for 80% of people, but program B works better for 20% of people. But in a parallel groups design, everyone either just does A or just does B. And so you're, you're not going to be able to get that nuance, um, and so I think we need more crossover trials and more um, more within subject designs to uh, to kind of like be able to tease some of those things out. Uh, so the the first level is just sorting out, you know, like like being able to say like these are kind of the the generalities of of like a to to get away from like program a program b nomenclature like like say something like uh like proximity to failure or, or let, let's go with training volume let's go with training volume um you know if you ran a study where it's like five sets per per muscle group per week versus 10 sets per muscle group per week or something like that um if you if you run that study with a parallel groups design like st studies like this a, a lot of them have been conducted they tend to find significantly more muscle growth with the higher training volume. But if you do that with, say, a within subjects design, where instead of, you know, you're doing uh, bench press, uh, you know, with both of your arms and, uh, you know, one group is doing 10 sets, one group is doing five sets with a within subject design, you might have like a machine chest press and you do five sets with one arm, 10 sets with the other arm. Uh, or like bicep curls, 10 sets with one arm, five sets with the other arm. And then like you can see like each subject is serving as their own control, which also like uh, gets around a lot of the potential hurdles and drawbacks of of small sample research. Because with small sample research, if, if you have just like a handful of people who respond really well or really poorly, like that can shift like one exceptional subject can really shift group averages if you have eight subjects per group. But with a within subject design, everyone's serving as their own control. Like, hey, if your right arm is a hyper responder to hypertrophy, your left arm probably is as well. Uh, gets around issues with nutritional control because guess what? Your right arm is consuming just as many calories as your left arm. Uh, you know, sleep, stress management, all of those factors are controlled within subject. Um, and when you, when you do a study like that, you might see that like, Hey, for 70% of people, uh, or, eh, yeah, maybe for like 50% of people, there was like meaningfully more growth with 10 sets than five. And then maybe with 30% of people you see, ah, Hey, there's not much of a difference between five and 10 sets. And maybe with 20% of people, you would see more growth with five sets than 10, you know? So like you, you can sort of start sorting that out better. So that's kind of the first step just to, to um, better characterize the, the response heterogeneity. And then the second step would be to start sorting out the whys. You know, like if you see that 20% uh, of people do respond better to lower volume than higher volume, um, why is that, you know? And so that that's kind of the realm of more exploratory research. So it's it would you would want the same sort of like crossover or within subject designs, but you'd also be wanting to take just like a, a greater variety of measurements pre and post, which again kind of comes back to money. So you could do gene sequencing. You could take muscle biopsies and look at like uh, you know gene expression or um, like proteomics or like metabolomic uh, uh, variables and, and just look to see like, hey, what seem to be the predictive factors for why someone would respond better to lower or higher volume training? And you could apply that same sort of process across the board for all sorts of different training variables and then start to get a better idea of how specifically to individualize training so you don't necessarily have to go through that process of starting with what you think will work and then just over a period of maybe years, just like troubleshooting, iterating 
until you finally find something that works really well for each individual. You could, you know, maybe just put someone through a very thorough screening and assessment. And we would like have the background knowledge to know that like, hey, if you have all of these characteristics at baseline, we're like very confident that you're going to respond really well to this particular style of training um, versus someone else with just like different, just innate genetic and physiological characteristics. You're probably going to inherently respond much better to this very different style of training. Like, I, I think that th those are the sorts of things we could eventually get with the scientific process. Um, like, I, I think, I think, we're, I think that's, hopefully where the field will be going over the next 10 to 20 years. Like we're, we're certainly not there yet. Um, but I think that going down that road will, will yield like pretty, pretty big benefits for, for most lifters. I kicked around the idea to thinking like way out on the fringes, like where can things possibly go? Because <clears throat> you think of like, let's say, I don't want to mischaracterize firmer sciences, at least where there's there's less uncertainty or variability in your measurements because you're not dealing with like a human subject. It's like hugely variable from one to the next. You look at something like physics and it's like the, the differences are the individual variations, you know, an electron is an electron, but you know, human A and human B are like, you know, maybe they're the same, maybe they're not. And with all of the different variables that we have to get in and look at, I had thought that if you, what we're really not going to figure out what's what to the T you know, the way that we want to until we're in some exotic future where there's like nano robots taking measurements of like every biological process and, you know, putting it into some big data pool that only like Google could interpret. And mm -hmm. at that point, it's like, okay, what other technological advances have made the human body obsolete in the first place where that 10 or 20% improvement in potential hypertrophy could even make a difference. Um, that in subject design you talked about was very interesting because I had kind of intuitively thought the best you could get is like a twin study or something, mm -hmm. because it's not just that the same protocol might not work for each person in a group, which it seems intuitive that it wouldn't, but it doesn't even tend to work in the same person at like different points in their training lifetime yeah. where yeah. how experienced you are, what the most recent thing you did is, is going to influence and that is something that that didn't even pop up. That seems like a very interesting and creative solution. Are those types of studies, I, I mean, are they pretty uncommon? Are they like more difficult to run? You know, they are pretty uncommon. Like you, you definitely still see way more parallel groups designs, um, but they're, they're definitely becoming more common. Um, I think of... Yeah, like I, I almost never saw within subject designs five years ago. Um, but yeah, now, now I'll see, you know, I'll, I'll see, I'll see a, a good, a good subject or a good study with the within subjects design published every month or two, uh, give or take. So they're, they're starting to trickle out. Okay. 